I'm Elizabeth Evans, and I'm a homeschooling mom of four young kids. I'm figuring this out as I go, but I'm here to talk to Bonnie, who has been writing and speaking on the subject for over a decade and has been homeschooling for three decades. My name's Bonnie Landry. I've got seven kids. They're ages 13 to 33. I've been homeschooling for 29 years. I'm a wife, a mom, a grandma, um, I'm a speaker and a writer, and I'm an advocate of joy. So uh, we're here to provide this podcast so that homeschooling can look like you imagined it to be. All right. Hello. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, so we're both in new locations. So uh, those of you who are watching on YouTube will we'll notice that um, we're filming at a different time of day than we normally do recording. And so uh, here we are in different locations. So yep. if you want to check out Elizabeth's new room and my new room, just go on. <laughs> That's right. I couldn't, kick, I couldn't kick my family out of the main living space. So I'm up yeah, in my own exactly. room. <laughs> and I, I kicked my family out of the main living space. That's right. <laughs> That's okay. Great. So we we're going to talk about math today. We are in particular chocolate chip math, which I'd never heard of. Yes. So to get started, what is it? What is it? Okay, so here's here's the little book I wrote on chocolate chip math and it's very tiny as you can see, right? Read it yeah. in an evening kind of a book. So maybe it would be helpful if I if I talked about okay, I'll I answer give you the short answer and then I'll give you the longer answer, sort of how it developed. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, chocolate chip math is basically basically using chocolate chips to uh as a manipulative to help kids learn how to do basic arithmetic functions, okay? Um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, simple fractions, you know, counting, that sort of thing, okay? And um, so, so we use the chocolate chips, and we'll talk about that as we sort of go along in the, in the show, but um, we sort of use the chocolate chips just as the physical thing to make the, the um, concept a reality, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was um, when I was first starting out homeschooling, uh, I'll just give you some background. I was a non-math person. Okay, so I grew up every year. I was a good student, so math was the unusual part of my uh, my schooling. Uh, I grew up every year, not quite grasping what I needed to grasp that year, and then I would just get, but I would just sort of barely pass, and then I would uh, get moved on to the next grade, and so every year got worse, mm -hmm. and. I ended up a hating math and b feeling like um, you know math was was this huge uh, thing that was out to get me, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? you know that, that to trick me. Okay, and so when I started homeschooling my own kids, a lot of there was a lot of talk. You know, this is like in the early '90s. This is there's a lot of talk about. Um, manipulatives and using math manipulatives to, to help kids understand concepts. And so they're kind of expensive. If you go out and buy, you know, specifically math manipulatives, they're kind of expensive. And so I thought, okay, well, why don't I just use something around the house? And I thought, well, if I use chocolate chips, the kids will love that and it's yummy and they'll want to come and, and do this. So, so that was basically the idea of manipulatives and showing math concepts through tactile things was kind of the motivating factor. Um, and so for, for me, it was really, really important that my kids learned math in kind of a, a, a sense of wonder and awe and excitement about math and, and what we can do with math, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I used a lot of the what Ruth Beachick would call the natural inductive approach, you know, sort of math all around you and wondering about math and talking about math in a really natural way. But this was a way that I could have a little lesson and, and pull out information uh, from that lesson, you know, for my kids to have something tangible to, to uh, talk about math, creating an environment to talk about math. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that answers how you, you developed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, one thing that I'm thinking about <laughs> as a mom, is it messy? I just think of chocolate as kind of melty. <laughs> is it messy? Yeah. No, I didn't find it messy unless there was a toddler on my lap grabbing the chocolate chips, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It was messy. Um, so 
A, choose a brand of chocolate chips. You don't have to use chocolate chips. You know that, right? You can yeah, use some yeah. other, you know, uh, thing, raisins or whatever. Chocolate chips are pretty attractive though. Yeah. Um, and so uh, they would get, I would get those little tiny paper cups, uh -huh. you know, yeah. Yeah. and I'd put a few in the paper cup and we would dump them out on the table. And that's where we would sort of do our, our, um, you know, chocolate chip math, right? We'd, we'd yeah. be counting them out on the table. So they're not holding them in their hand per se. Yeah. And I generally would just say, well, just leave them on the table, then you can eat them, right? So they knew they would get them yeah. um, at the end of the lesson. Um, you know, but yeah, the, 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 uh, to if the toddlers got into them and were holding chocolate chips in their mat, in their hands, then yeah, that's going to get messy, right? Yeah. I always wear an apron. I don't know if you're an apron person, but I wear an apron basically 100% of the time that I'm home. Okay, okay. <laughs> so that helps a lot. Yeah. But so I didn't find it particularly messy because, you know, they weren't holding them in their hands. But that's okay. a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I think of mess. And I don't know, my kids wouldn't leave them alone. They, because mm -hmm. we've done stuff with like dried noodles and they cannot right. stop touching them but, right yeah they would touch them I mean that's really the point right yeah. but in terms of just holding them in their hands yeah you know that that uh but also the lesson's really short it's not like I'm they're drooling over chocolate chips for an hour you yeah. know I mean five minutes you know would be the average chocolate chip math lesson right right uh yeah Okay, well, I was going to ask, how long do you spend on math each day? So it's right. so, quick lessons? Yeah, well, first of all, a couple things. Chocolate chip math is really geared at a pretty young age group, okay? Sort of K to three would probably be the, the age group we'd be talking about. But I think it's so important to be laying that foundation and groundwork as the kids get older and when they move into more sort of conceptual math or a math textbook, mm -hmm. uh, to lay that groundwork of really, really clear understanding. Okay. So we're talking about K to three, but we're really talking about a much bigger picture here mm -hmm. that if kids don't have a really solid foundation, everything else is going to be difficult or even impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we talk about how much time we spend, bear in mind that the goal of that is to be absolutely certain that your child knows the basics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now for me, so I know I'm go sort of going beyond the scope of your question, but I think it, it's relevant okay. for me because math was so confusing. I, I wanted to know for sure that my kids were going to understand a concept before we moved on to another concept, right? Mm -hmm. That, that this was really solid. And so if you're working in a grade seven math book and your kids don't have the basics down really, really clearly, I would stop doing what you're doing and go back and do the basics and make sure that they absolutely know, you know, what addition is, what subtraction is, how it works, how to, how, what multiplication is, what division is, how it works make sure they understand those really, really basic concepts before you move on to something else. And, um, you know, I think that, so when, when I say five minutes a day, you could also be working in another math book. If you felt not confident mm -hmm. working in a math book, uh, working without a math book or a math text, you could still be doing that. But I would say absolutely take the five minutes a day and do this little formation thing um, that happens with math in chocolate chip math, because it's going to establish really strong math skills later on. Right. And that's, right. and that's just vital beyond words. Right. Okay. So it, I mean, we don't have chocolate chips here, but are you able to explain what a, a lesson would look like if you're, you're say a teaching addition with chocolate chips, what would that sure. kind of look well, like? Let's, you know, let's sort of run through the, the gamut. Like if you were first starting and I would start chocolate chip math. Some of my kids started at three because they looked like, you know, they're looking at a situation and they're thinking oh, that looks fun and yummy. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, you know, of course, what kid wouldn't want to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so we would start off just counting you know, and so I would say, so first of all, we count together. So, you know, I take their finger and we move one chocolate chip over one, two, mm -hmm. three, you know, and so we just count, maybe we start with up to five and we move up to up to 10 or whatever. Um, we, and then I start counting. So I count every other number. So I'll say, I'll say one, 
and then they say two and if they don't know then I say so that's two mm -hmm. right and three you know we, we need to count we need to have an understanding of numbers before we move on to anything else right. and you know when that happens like my little grandson over here he's four and he's just all of a sudden he's known about numbers for a long time and he you know counts but all of a sudden in the last month or two he knows what it means mm -hmm. right because he will count things and he'll count them accurately right yeah. there are six sunflowers in my garden oh there are six people sitting at this table mm -hmm. there are oh you know uncle abel just walked away there are five people at this table now you know like his all of a sudden his understanding of numbers is just boom it's there right yeah. and so that's the moment that you're going to actually start working with the numbers okay, okay. And, and seeing what they can do but in the meantime we can count we can yeah. take turns counting then they can count independently then you can start comparing things right mm -hmm. there's you know maybe you put three chocolate chips in this group and four chocolate chips in this group which one has more yeah right um you know how could we make them even mm -hmm. you know if i was giving chocolate chips to you and your brother you want the same amount how would we change this to make that even okay right. so so those little just very sort of natural um concepts happening even at a very young age you can do you know half could you give half of those to me and put them in my pile you get to eat them but i just want to see if you can know how many is half right how would we find out what half is yeah right yeah and so things like uh lining them up say there was six chocolate chips and he gave me half and i had half uh, he gave me half and he had half that that okay well how do we actually know that it's exactly half well mm -hmm. we could line them up one and one one and one one and one mm -hmm. okay well now we know it's exactly half what if there was one left over Oh dear, who gets that one? You know, not everything divides evenly in half. So we right. start with those kinds of conversations, right? Then we're going to move from that. Once we know that they solidly understand what numbers mean and what they represent, okay? Mm -hmm. Then we can start moving into things like, okay, adding. So we would just, go, we called it plus ones in our house. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I have three chocolate chips and we add one more to my pile, how many do I have now? Right. So just plus one, minus one, yeah. you know, so we would do that, you know, two or three times every, you know, math lesson. Okay. If you, if I had, if I had 14 chocolate chips and you gave me one more, how many would I have? Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, that's a very simple thing. And then from there, okay, well now what if we added two to our pile? Now you have three. What if we added two more to your pile? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, you know, this is where we're starting with, with subtraction and addition, just plus ones and plus twos. And then of course, once they understand those concepts really well, you can move further out. Uh, years ago, I went to a talk, a speaker at a conference who was speaking about math. And she said that the number that we can hold in our brain mm -hmm. really, really easily visually, we can visualize in our brain is five. And that was a really helpful thing to me because you think, and you actually break that down. You don't think of five things. Like if somebody says five apples, you don't picture five apples, you picture three and two mm -hmm. usually, right? And so we, it's easy for us to picture three and two. And so that was a, that was a really neat thing for me to kind of work with, with my kids. Mm -hmm. is that if we think in sort of fives, uh, that we can, in, we, when we think about introducing things that can be in the back of our mind, that those are easier things for kids to, to wrap their brain around. Right. So, uh, from there, then we would be going, um, you know, obviously subtracting and then multiplying. Okay. You have three groups of two, right? And that's so easy. When we talk about three groups of something using a, a, a multiplication sign, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing for some kids to wrap their brain around. What, what, is, what does this mean? Yeah. You know. But if we say, okay, let's take three groups and put two chocolate chips in each group, mm -hmm. right? It's so obvious what three groups of two is. You know. Oh, and look, two groups of three is the same thing. Yeah. Right. So we can show them those things as we as we move along, right? So. Once we get up into higher numbers, obviously we're not going to use chocolate chips anymore, right? Yeah. Because it becomes imprudent. You know, you're not going to have a hundred hot chocolate chips that you pour out for your kids. You know, I might go up to say 20, yeah. you know, and after that, then we start working with paper. Right. Yeah. yeah. But they usually, even when I start on paper, I usually just pour a few chocolate chips into a cup and at the end of their lesson or even during their lesson, they could get to eat their chocolate chips, right? Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. 
so I, I'm terrible at math. That's why I, I follow the Saxon math book because it tells right. me what to say for each step of the way. Um, and so I feel like I can't fail if I'm doing exactly what the book says. Yeah. Um, and so this year we started with multiplication and I have never, I went through the school system. I have never heard the groups of that. I don't know if I just spaced out or what, but that right. to me. And so I'm teaching this to my kids and I'm thinking this would have made so much more sense for me if I had knew, known it this way growing yeah. up. <laughs> I know. Well, I think I was, I was well into times tables when a teacher I had refer used the term groups of. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, is that what that means? Yeah. That means group. That means, oh, God, right. <laughs> it changed everything, right? It changed everything. It does. Because otherwise, does. I was just memorizing completely random bits of information. Yeah, yeah. I know. Right. Well, and also I learned um, like tricks. So, okay, so here's another question. I've found out with the Saxon math book that there are tricks to remember addition. So like your um, nine addition facts, if you think of, you know, so nine plus four equals 13. Yeah. And the 13, if you put three plus one, that equals four. So that's a way to remember that nine plus oh, four equals Oh, three. right. Okay. So yeah. my question is, are there, do you still learn those tricks that, you know, are helpful with that? With oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But of course that comes later on Okay. and they're learning, you know, when you've sort of gone beyond the chocolate chips, right. That right. comes later on, Yeah. Uh, you know, and any, any um, app or program that you use for times tables is definitely going to explore sort of the, you know, the, the uh, tricks of timetables or the, the trickier ones, Right. you know, but one of the best things I ever learned with my kids doing timetables was, was when they get to the point where you want them to be memorizing times tables and they're kind of doing that all the way along right mm -hmm. uh that you you actually take a you know um a chart that's got you know one by twelve one one to twelve and one to twelve you know like a what do they call a multiplication chart right yeah. and you fill in all the ones they know okay. okay they know the fives they know the tens they know the twos they know the ones they know the zeros you know they, there's lots of them they know and you'll find that there's only actually a few that require mem memorizing Okay. You know, and so that was really helpful to me is like, because I thought, oh, it's so much to remember. Right. You know, and again, breaking it down. So instead of trying to learn all the, the uh, memory work at the same time, you know, all the, the times tables, break it down. And for, you know, three weeks or four weeks, just work on the six times tables. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, those are, those, those make it easy, but we, so this, when I'm transitioning my kids from chocolate chip math into paper math, I'm not tending to use a textbook right. comes a little later for us. But what I do is I move them into a, just a notebook and then the things that we're doing with the chocolate chip math, I write it down. Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm writing down the numbers and I'm writing down the symbols. So we're still doing chocolate chip math, but I'm writing it down by this time they can recognize their numbers and they know their numbers. Um, but that I'm writing the symbols down. So six plus two, well, here's the six, here's the two in chocolate chips. Here's the symbol that means, mm -hmm. Uh, plus, you know, whenever, whenever they're ready for that. And for some kids, that'll be right away. And for some kids, the idea that you're using a symbol instead of saying six and two mm -hmm. just takes longer to gel. Right. So we just have to be sensitive to, to, you know, when they're ready. Right. And yeah. I think that goes back to, we've talked about this several times, the um, trying to check off boxes, you yeah. know, and feeling like, I, I think it's as a homeschooling mom, the idea, it's the unintentional rushing through, like you've got to yeah. know this. So we've got to keep going. And, you know, even yeah. if you don't quite understand it. Um, and so that's a fault on my part or any of us parents trying to homeschool. And Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, we're, we're notorious for that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we don't do ourselves, you know, it just creates stress. Right. right? Yeah. Um, something that I was going to say that I think is sort of an important note about math is, and why to me, it's just so vital to, to spend these years making sure they're really, really solid mm -hmm. is that when, when you're learning math, it's cyclical, right? So you kind of mm -hmm. learn the same things over and over again every year in a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. 
So at a little bit higher level every year, so a little bit more material. So for fractions, for example, you're going to first of all learn halves and quarters. And then later on, you're going to learn, uh, you know, uh, more uh, minute fractions, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to start learning how to add those fractions together and subtract them and multiply them and divide them. And then what do you, you know, turn them into decimals and you're, you know, all the things that you learn about fractions is introduced a little bit at a time every year at a slightly higher level. So we have sort of this spiraling upward effect, right? Mm -hmm. What we have to bear in mind in terms of, and this really plays into the whole idea of checking off boxes. What we have to bear in mind is that if you took a, a 12 or 14 year old kid who had, had say never really learned math, Okay, I'm not suggesting you do that. I'm just saying, think about it for a moment. If you said to them, we are, uh, there's a part of math that is, math is all learning about numbers and how they work together and how we can use them for, for finding information in the world, right? Um, there's a thing we call fractions, okay? So it's when we split things into parts, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so if we get each, you know, an equal part, we, that's half, right? So if we take a circle and divide it down the middle, it's called a half. Mm -hmm. If we divide it again, it's called quarters. So they didn't need six years of schooling to know that, okay? Right. Because a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old is going to right away say, oh, okay, that's a half and that's a quarter. It's not like it had to be beaten into them to understand that. Right. Oh, okay, and there's eighths and sixteenths and thirty seconds, and there's all these other forms of fractions. So to get a grip on all of that might take a little longer. Okay, but then you can say you can add fractions, mm -hmm. you know, and and this is how you might do that. This is a, what a numerator is. This is what a denominator is. But in a in a pretty short span of time, you could take a twelve or fourteen year old and teach them everything that a twelve or fourteen year old knows about fractions, maybe in a month. Yeah. Okay. So we we get really caught up in these you know ideas of of that ha having to learn things and having to check boxes you're there they will get it eventually yeah okay and and if they had no math at all they would still get it okay and they would get it in a much shorter time okay yeah so when we're i think that what we have to bear in mind is when we're teaching them about numbers when they're young what we're teaching them is wonder and excitement and purpose of numbers Okay. And in that you're building some really, really solid foundation that they can use later on, because the reality is that that 12 year old who has no math, it's going to be much easier for him to add and subtract fractions if he can already add and subtract whole numbers really, really well. Right. Okay. That's going to be a big, uh, a big boost in his ability. Okay. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to learn that thing in order to do the new thing. Okay. Yeah. So, so you know, that's where we, we get so bogged down in the, in the checking off of boxes and, you know, making sure we're doing all the things that the book says we're supposed to do. But we have to bear in mind that cyclical, cyclical effect of math and how we would learn it if we were older, right? Okay. So if your kid's not getting something, don't hammer him over the head with it. He will get it mm -hmm. eventually. That will happen. But, you know, you have to just give them as much as they can absorb at the time and then move on to something new, right? Yeah. So then, um, what do you do? My oldest hates math. He fights me on it. So yeah. how can I sort of reverse the damage of disliking math and, and bringing him, you know, to be interested? I, I, I don't feel like he has to like it, yeah. but maybe to not be so. He's how old again, Elizabeth? He's eight and a half. Oh, okay. I mean, a lot of times the reason kids hate math is the repetitive nature of it, right? Mm -hmm. So is he, is he understanding what he's learning? Yeah, he's actually really good at it. He just, okay. he doesn't like the worksheets. He doesn't like, you know, right. sitting down and doing his fact sheets. He just, right. I mean, anytime I tell him he has to pick up a pencil and write something down, <laughs> he freaks out on me. Right. Yeah. There's, we call them pencil phobes. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of kids like that. So, I mean, it might be the kinds of thing that at his age, it's certainly not too late to, to ramp back and just instill in him a sense of fun about numbers, right? Yeah. So a couple of things I would suggest. One of them is just trying some chocolate chip math. So, you know, today we're not doing worksheets. We're doing this, right? We're not doing any pencil work today. And maybe you can say every other day, 
we'll do pencil work and, and the days in between we'll do chocolate chip math. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, that might be interesting and fun for him, right. Just to, yeah. to sort of explore what he knows um, and understand the terminology that he's learning in his book. And you can just draw on whatever book he's using to, to talk about, you know, math concepts, mm -hmm. but that might be fun. So there's other sources though. Like, have you learned, have you heard about life of Fred? No. Okay. So life of Fred is just has a very different approach to teaching math and I would, I would suggest to people, I'll put a link in the show notes, but I would suggest to people to look it up because uh, it would, you know, be sort of a whole show just talking about life of Fred and kind of their approach to math. It was very interesting. Um, it wasn't super awesome for my kids. I, when I found out about it, I this is amazing. I would have flourished with this kind of math, Okay. Uh, but they kind of sat on the shelf. We did a little bit of it, just didn't really jive with my kids. I think because of the sort of approach that we have had with math that it, mm -hmm. it just wasn't it was sort of didn't make sense to them and so or not you know some of them i use it with some of them a little bit um but i know some people had massive success with with uh life of fred um and also another um program that is fairly fairly expensive but i've heard just amazing things about is math uc m-a-t-h-u-s-e-e -E. it's okay. a manipulative based math based math goes right up to high school and um you know if you have a kid struggling with math, it's probably a good investment, even if it's expensive, because uh, they will understand math better. They'll grow up understanding math. And that's ultimately what we want. Yeah. But if it's just a matter of that basic knowledge, before you invest in something like that, do some chocolate chip math, make math fun, make, give it some wonder first, Yeah. right? And I don't think we ever did a math program where we did every question ever, right? Okay. Every second question you know, was, was generally the go-to, whether it was a math worksheet or whether it was a textbook, when they got to that level, you know, just do, uh, you know, do what you, every, every second lesson, every second question, because, you know, they're usually going through their, you know, everything they've learned up till now, and they've got a variety of questions. So, you know, course of a week, you're going to go to all the variety of lessons that they've learned up till now. So you're con having that constant review. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times for a lot of kids, it's just so tedious. Yeah. Right especially if they know what they're doing. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating if they don't know what they're doing and it's tedious if they do. Right. Right. So I don't see a big advantage in doing 30 questions a day. Okay. Right. So, um, just as how it relates to me, Saxon math with the worksheets, yeah. it is, you know, every day it's repetitive, you know, and then maybe just a little, like one of them is what they've learned in that lesson for the day. Right. And so would you suggest almost that there's not a need for them to do those worksheets every day, maybe even just once a week and then um, the review? I mean. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that from a young age, an hour of math per day, I think is overkill. Yeah. Right. I think that's death to math, right? Death to mm -hmm. love of math, death to desire to do math when they're young. I mean, later on, I don't think any of my kids did an hour a day until like, you know, they got up into maybe grade 11 and 12. Yeah. Um, and even then probably it was less than that 40 minutes or something like that, okay. that their math lessons were uh, just because in a classroom setting, you set aside an hour for math, but you're also allowing that the teacher has to go around to all the kids who are struggling and, and trying to get their math done, right? So, um, you know, I think that we have to assume that an hour of math is probably too much for most people, right? And in school, that's not actually how much math they're doing every day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to pull myself back to what was the original question of this train the, the well, train I just math. sent us on or the original. Oh, how to reestablish the love yes. of math. Yeah. Right. So, so I think that's part of it is going, going back to that, finding resources that are, are really helpful. Mm -hmm. There's a series of math books that I found really, really helpful called key Two. So it was key to like K E Y T O and then either decimals or fractions or um, angles or, you know, uh, geometry, whatever um, aspect of math. Now they're not a cyclical math where they're sort of reviewing um, and cycling through the different aspects of math, but key two focuses on one thing for a short time. And they're these little thin workbooks. 
So they're very manageable. For kids who feel a bit overwhelmed with math, that mm -hmm. was a really good resource. I used them a number of times and I just used them for the thing that that particular person was struggling with. Okay. So, so that's one thing for a resource for sort of uh, focusing on something that maybe they're not liking or not understanding. Right. Okay. Key to uh, the other thing is Khan Academy. Um, you know, not necessarily as an online learning, but if they're having trouble with a concept, go to Khan Academy, look it up on, on their website. Do they have a little five minute video on this particular aspect of math that might explain it better or differently than I explain it. Okay. And so if that's the case, you can use that. If the kid still doesn't understand it, you can just wait and revisit that later. Right. So those are okay. some ways we can sort of come back to the place where math isn't horrible. Right. Okay. And they're not hating it less time. Another thing is just sitting with them, you know, and, and I know that sounds like a lot, especially when you have lots of kids, but if you keep the lessons really short and you're sitting with them, I'm talking five or 10 minutes and you're sitting yeah. with them even for part of their lesson, it just gives them confidence. A lot of kids, they will just get confidence and know that you're there and know they can ask a question and they're not sitting there frustrated thinking, I don't know how to do this thing. You know, and if we sit with them, often that's the thing that just gets them over the fear of it or the dislike of it, mm -hmm. right? So just some thoughts on, on where you can go with that. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay. So then why chocolate chip math as opposed to traditional workbooks? I mean, you've sort of touched on that a little bit, but maybe more specifically, if you could talk about that. Right. Uh, I think mostly for the reasons that we just talked about that, that a lot of kids get wiggy with workbooks. Mm -hmm. A lot of workbooks are set up in kind of a school-ish way. And I think this is why Life of Fred is really good because they, there's way less uh, kind of busy work, okay. repetitive work. You know, they kind of just cut to the chase. That's okay. one of the advantages of Life of Fred. So there's nothing wrong with a workbook per se. People are trying to produce something that your kid can can improve their education on, right? right? That's, that's yeah. a goal of, of uh, you know, a workbook. Um, so there's nothing inherently bad or evil about that. What it does is it puts a pressure on you and sometimes on the child as well, mm -hmm. right? To do every page in that workbook, including the things that they already know and including that which is, um, is too uh, much for them to understand right now. So, you know, we can get very antsy if our child, okay, well, they're in grade two and they're supposed to be knowing this, you know, that we have to just toss the whole supposed to be, right? Try it, see if they understand it. If they don't, revisit it. Okay. You know, but we get like, well, but they have to know this. This is the thing they have to know right now. I'll just use, say, fractions, fractions as an example. They're not getting it. They're not getting it. Well, they're going to get it eventually. You know, and if we get all wound up or we get frustrated with them because they're stuck on fractions, we can't move on, right? But the reality is there's many things you could move on on and you just make a note to yourself. Okay, we have to go back and, and um, you know, check on fractions and that they're understanding it next year or in three months or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So there's pressure from a sort of a, um, a more traditional workbook. And if, you know, I think it's a good idea to get beyond that pressure. Right. right. And, and allow the books to work for us and not against us. Right. You know. So then uh, one thing that I was thinking about was, you know, you're saying to if they're not getting it, move on, maybe come back. Uh, the way right. books are structured. Is there a reason you shouldn't, I guess, move on? You, you know, like it's obvious that you do addition and then subtraction. Right. You know, you don't right. want to skip over addition and because that just doesn't make sense but how do you know okay it's okay to skip fractions because we don't really need that knowledge right. for a b c and d um but sometimes i'm i'm unaware of oh well hey it'd be really good if they had known this first and we already jumped in right this. yeah and so that's where you know your your traditional textbook is going to to be really helpful in in terms of going along in a linear way. Mm -hmm. Now, on when we talk about math sort of being linear, as in you learn one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing, there are several subject areas, right? So we yeah. learn fractions and we learn addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We learn, um, we learn decimals, you know, various aspects of math. 
all are linear. So every year, say they introduce fractions, you know, in kindergarten or grade one, every year we learn a little bit more about that particular topic. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we can skip fractions in the sense that we know we can jump in in grade four if we had to and learn yeah. fractions. OK, yeah. at, some, at the point at which you notice that they're they're starting to understand fractions, right? You're going to revisit occasionally something like math, something like adding. If a child has no idea what you're talking about when you're talking about doing long addition mm -hmm. and they're just not understanding that at all, you can't really move forward in addition until they understand long addition. Mm -hmm. right so they will get that at some point but you may need to spend you know a lot of time on that or a lot of time even backing off of it yeah. and then you know if they if they are just completely clued out come back a week later two weeks later okay let's see if we can try long addition again okay so i'm going to um you know try another approach maybe you can even be educating yourself okay how can i approach this a little bit differently mm -hmm. you know and that's why it's nice to have more than one resource around your house for teaching math, because, uh, you know, you can approach like the, like the, you know, um, groups of, right. Yeah. Sometimes a different terminology, different understanding can just help the child. Oh, okay. Have that dawning moment. Okay. Yeah. That moment, they're not going to have the dawning moment until their brain is ready. So, yeah. so then you just keep doing your basic math, uh, addition that you're doing and you keep trying. Mm -hmm. occasionally you keep trying long addition one day it's going to be oh they'll get it yeah right so so that's what we're shooting for so you know we can't get that and it would be ridiculous to push them on to long addition long addition if if they weren't getting it right, right. so just okay well you know obviously we're just going to have to start next year's math book even though they're not getting it no it'd be way better to go back and um get out your chocolate chips and show them long addition over and over again until they had that you know but without beating them overhead with it take breaks right if they're not yeah. getting it, take breaks in between when you're you're um revisiting it right yeah so okay well then here is my final question and it okay. may be somewhat obvious but how do you get started <laughs> do you just get a cup with chocolate chips and just go to it yes well of course you know when you're when you've got family, like by the time you're doing chocolate chip math with your second or third kid, they get it already. They know that mom sits down and does chocolate chip math and they know what that looks like. Right. Yeah. But with, you know, with your first or second child, um, you know, yeah, I would just get a little, little, one of those little paper cups of chocolate chips and I'd pour them out and I said, let's count these. <laughs> right. And usually I do something very simple. Like if they're four, I'll say, can you help me count out four chocolate chips? Yeah. And we literally just, you know, move the chocolate chips with our fingers. And if they said something like, well, can I eat them as I count them? I'll, I would say, actually, we're going to put them in a pile of four first, then you can eat them mm -hmm. before we do anything else. You know, because the little kids, obviously, the self sense of self-control is right. <laughs> poor. But, yeah. you know, if you count four chocolate chips, yeah. then they get to eat those, right? Oh, and how old is your sister? She's two. Let's count two chocolate chips. It's really just that simple. You know, I pour out a few chocolate chips and we count them and we add them together and we subtract them and we you know make little groups as we move along in sort of our skill level right so it's, yeah. it's just that simple it's just simple and fun yeah you know okay well i actually thought of another question really quick. okay <laughs> that's okay. okay so when when do you transition from chocolate chip math to more traditional you know whether it's book work or you know Right. Yeah, I think I think that is very kid dependent. Okay. So with my oldest daughter, we didn't do any formal math at all until she was 12. Right. So okay. everything was just very informal. I didn't I, I don't know if I did chocolate chip math with her. Actually, I might have started that with my second, but everything was very tactile and measuring and, you know, um, all kinds of I was just very aware of math. I really recommend uh, I, I think I recommend these every show, but um, Ruth Beachick's book, The Three R's, because she talks about opportunities for math in everyday life and how to okay. capitalize on them. Right. And that's a really important, uh, really important thing to to be aware of, because yeah. even if you're just going a traditional workbook textbook method, if you're not aware of math in everyday life, it's pretty hard to help kids understand when they'll use math. Right. right? 
because a lot of times kids get frustrated with math because they don't know when to use it. You know, like yeah. what, what, what good is this to me? You know? Right. Um, and so uh, the transition, I would say for most of my kids sometime between say seven or eight and 10 or 11. Okay. Right. Okay. So from chocolate chip math to chocolate chips and a book in front of them, and then um, just the notebook and then into a workbook or a textbook. Right. Okay. Sort of in that, in that um, transition. But you know, my kids, even in high school, when they were off doing on their own, I would usually, when they, at some point in their schooling, I would bring them down like a mocha or a hot chocolate or, you know, a little piece of, you know, Purdy's chocolate or something. And they would get uh, a bit of chocolate while they sat there doing their schoolwork. <laughs> Because <laughs> I felt like it was remnants of chocolate chip mouth. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is that it for questions? That's it for questions. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, if any more questions or if people want to address sort of math at different levels and resources for math at different levels, uh, just shoot us your questions uh, or on any other topic for that matter. I'd um, also be curious to hear what people use instead of chocolate chips. So comments. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Somebody told me, what did they use? Skittles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, if you're deeply opposed to sugar, I was, I was uh, pretty tight restrictions with my older kids about how much sugar they got, but I felt like, you know, 10 or 12 chocolate chips was probably okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so a couple things. So you can send your questions to our, my Facebook page or message me on the Facebook page, make joy normal or my email address, which is on my blog, bonnielandry.ca. And, uh, or what's the other way of getting hold of me? Oh, through Instagram. A lot of people yeah. send questions through Instagram, which is fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a reminder, I have, I'm doing a how to write a paragraph class uh, on July 11th at 10 in the morning. If people are interested in that, I'll put the link to that in the show notes. Um, excuse me, uh, for whoever's interested. And I'm going to really, really break it down. How to write a paragraph. And this is for parents to teach their children how to write a paragraph. And I had a, an interesting thought just come across my desk today that I will, and we'll wrap up right after this. But a, a lady that I have gotten to know over Facebook and, you know, have interacted with quite a few times said something about being interested in following this particular program, a particular program for school. But the only advantage she could really see was the weekly group meetups, right? And I thought, why couldn't we do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? If people, people are meeting up in groups because they want support, mm -hmm. um, they want advice, they want accountability, right? Those are the reasons that people want to meet up. And so I thought that's something we could absolutely take a look at. And I would really love people's feedback via those same, uh, you know, sources of getting hold of me that I just gave you. Let me know if that's an attractive thing. And I'm what here's what I've got in my mind, and, and I'm open to um, thoughts on this. Sort of like um, keeping groups small, maybe 25 or 30 people, having an hour a week where that particular group of people gets together and brings their questions, their concerns, their um, successes, whatever it is, you know, a sort of a, a very informal meetup, and keep that really, really affordable so that, and I don't know, I'm thinking, you know, five to ten dollars a month or a hundred dollars for the year for a, a kind of that that resource rather than if you would prefer to be schooling in this way rather than being a part of a program if that puts pressure if you feel pressured by that mm -hmm. then this might answer those needs in a really in a really simple way but i'd like to feedback before i jump in uh, i'd like some feedback from people if they're willing to give it so my, i'm going to leave my email address here it's make joy normal at gmail.com so let me know um if that's something you'd be interested in. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we'll say goodbye and I will chat with you next week. And well, I hope to hear about chocolate chip math, the successes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no kidding. <laughs> so we'll put everything in the show notes. Thank you. Okay, bye for now. Bye. bye.